So let's go backpacking this morning. You're all in perfect health and physical shape, and we're going to hike in the high Sierras, like I used to do. <laughs> um, and our map, which shows the trail, shows that we're going to go above the tree line and we're going to reach the top of the peak, maybe Mount Whitney, you know, for example. And you know that in the Sierras, because of the late storms like we've been having, you can hike in July in the Sierras and still come across very hard patches of snow and ice. They're there all year long, and if they're in front of your trail, you have a treacherous uh, obstacle to cross. And so you get up early in the morning, we do, and we're going, we're hiking, and finally, you know, we reach this spot where we can rest, and there before us we can see the peak and all of its glory in the sunshine, and we see the switchbacks going up. Have you ever seen that, where you can just watch and see the switchbacks? And so you take out your binoculars, and you look up, and sure enough, there's some other hikers that got up a lot earlier than you did, and they're already up there. But you notice that right before them is this huge patch of snow-hard ice up there that is crossing the trail, and you're going to watch. Now, how are they going to get across that? And sure enough, the leader pulls out an ice axe. And he begins to hack away and grip himself as they walk across this. Everyone has to have an ice axe. You're not going to get across that snowy patch. I mean, that is treacherous hiking when you cross something like that. And so we know in advance by looking ahead at those who are hiking ahead of us that when we get to that spot, that rough spot, if we're going to make it to the top, we too have to have our ice axe. And we brought ours along, didn't we? Right? We were prepared. For that. And so Hebrews is like that. It has taken us to a plateau. And in Hebrews chapter 11, he is going to talk about people who have gone on before us, who have faced the mountain and the, and the difficulties of life, and they have made it to the top. But the key instrument, the key element that has enabled them to get through life and to the top, the heavenly Jerusalem, right, is the ice axe of faith. They all had it. It was the defining characteristic that enabled them to get to the top. And so in Hebrews 11, you have men and women, 16 particularly, who were normal, ordinary people, but they possessed an uncommon faith. They are pioneers for us. They are examples for us to follow. They have gone on ahead, and we need to learn from their examples of what it looks like to live by faith. And so let's look at the three names that we're going to consider today. The first example of faith in action is, is a common shepherd named Abel. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. So go with me to Genesis chapter 4. Verse 1. It says, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And later she got, gave birth to a, his brother named Abel, Cain and Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And so Cain went and said to his brother, Hey, let's go out to the field for a walk. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So in this story of Cain and Abel, and it's always Cain who killed Abel, by the way. Firstborn killed the secondborn. 
You have two brothers, Cain and Abel. You have two vocations. Cain is a farmer, Abel is a shepherd. You have two offerings, one from plant life, one from animal life. You have two responses from God. Cain, his offering was found unfavorable in God's eyes. Abel's offering was found favorable. And you see the two results. Sin, Abel, Cain continued to sin and murdered his brother Abel. It says that by faith, Abel, the younger, brought God a better offering than Cain. Now these offerings, again, we are not told what motivated them to do it. It just says that one day they offered these offerings. They are personal gifts of homage or allegiance. And this word used later in the Old Testament not only refers to animal sacrifices, but also to what they called grain or cereal offerings. And so scholars think that we really shouldn't look at the offering per se, whether it was the offering that was rejected, but rather look at the offerer. Look at the giver, not the gift. Because that is really what God is interested in, uh, is the heart of the giver. And so most scholars will, will tell us that it's about Abel's heart versus Cain's heart, not about what they gave, whether it's an animal or a plant offering. What is clear from the text is that Cain demonstrates that his heart is not right with God. In verses 6 through 7, God comes to Cain and confronts him that he is angry and his face has fallen. He, he has a, a, a bent attitude. He is not happy. And God gives him a second chance. He says, if you do what is right now, will you not be accepted? Second chance. If you change your attitude, Cain, you can find the same acceptance and favor that your brother has discovered. God is pleading with Cain to repent and to change his attitude. God is gracious and gives him this opportunity to change and warns him what will happen if he does not. And he does not. He does not repent. He does not change his attitude. And in fact, he goes out, deceives his brother, and violently murders him in the field. Cain's offering was rejected because of Cain's heart. Cain did not believe in the existence of God. He did not offer his offering with the full confidence that God cares for him and that God is going to reward him in the future. This is the definition of faith. That God exists, that he cares, that he rewards those who diligently seek him. This is the definition from last Sunday. Abel did. Abel offered his offering in faith in the full ex uh, confidence that God exists, that uh, he cares, and that he is going to reward that faith in the future. Three times it says, by faith he was commended, that is, Abel was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. Abel had taken the best of his flocks, his plural, not just one sheep, but several sheep perhaps, and offered these with the deep confidence that God, you really do exist, I can't see you, but I believe that you're there, that you care for me, and that you're going to reward and take care of my life in the future. God commends. You see, only God knows somebody's heart, right? I don't, you don't, God does. He is the judge and the witness of genuine faith. God reads everyone's motive perfectly. He doesn't make a mistake in that regard. And it says that, that he accepted Abel's offering and Abel's attitude. You know, the word accepted just means, the Hebrew means to lift up the corners of your mouth. That's what the word means. So God is smiling in a sense. That's, that's the metaphor in that word. What Cain brings and what Cain's, uh, Abel's heart is about, excuse me, Abel, <laughs> don't get those two confused. Uh, God smiles. He lifts up the corners of his mouth because of his heart attitude. So what is the reward for Abel acting in faith that God exists, that he cares, that he is going to reward him? Premature death. 
really? Cain murders his brother. But the author of Hebrews says, wait a second. By faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. He being dead still speaks, we say, right? Yes, Abel died a premature death. But his faith continues to be a living voice for us even to this day. Abel's faith is a constant witness and example for us to follow. It is recorded here in Scripture. He is in the hall of faith, Abel, because of what he did way back then. So what are some lessons we can learn about faith? Well, from Cain and Abel, we can see that living by faith may provoke hostility in others. I don't want that to happen. You don't want that to happen, but it happened. Secondly, living by faith may not be rewarded in this life. Verse 13 of chapter 11 says this, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. You read through Hebrews 11 and there's a whole paragraph about the fact that you can live all your life by faith and not feel rewarded by that. It will come after death as it did in Abel's situation. But the third application is by faith, faith could be your your dominant life message. That's what Abel is remembered for. He being dead still speaks. His life still is communicating his faith. This is his eulogy. Think for a moment. If the people in your neighborhood were gathered having a little gossip session and the topic of faith came up, would your name be mentioned? Are you known as a person who has faith amongst those who know and love you? Uh, when I sit down and plan a funeral service, you know, I always ask about the person's religious and spiritual life. You know, it's always, oh, they had a good sense of humor. I hear that all the time. Did they have faith? What would people say about you who are planning your service? Are they going to talk about you as a person of faith? Abel being dead still speaks because of his faith. And so I challenge you to think about, are you a person of faith as Abel was? Our next example of faith in action is the ancient father named Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken away, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So I take you back to Genesis chapter 5, and it's a genealogy. Genesis chapter 5 is the genealogy from Abraham, oh no, Adam, excuse me, Adam to Noah. Ten generations of people. And uh, the pattern is very genealogical. A person lived, a person had sons and daughters, they procreated. And then they died. You know, it's like on a tombstone. They lived and they died. They lived and they died. All the generations until verse 18. It says, when Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. There's his name. And after he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived a total of 962 years, and then he died. And the Bible does want us to take those kinds of ages literally, and that's another whole sermon as to these large numbers that people lived in that time. But let's just say, for example, that they lived, they procreated, and they died. So in verse 21, it says that Enoch lived... 65 years, and he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. And altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. In verse 24, Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. As 
And you see here in the seventh generation, there is a break in the genealogical pattern. Something compels the author to stop with Enoch and give us some details that are highly significant. That Enoch doesn't just live and have children and die. No, Enoch lived different from somebody, everybody else. He lived distinctively. He lived memorably. The author puts this in, that Enoch walked with God. It means that he was in harmony with God. It means that he was in step with God. It means he had a right relationship with God. And the author of Hebrews takes that phrase, and in Hebrews 11:5 says, but before Enoch was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And then he goes on, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so I take those two phrases to be synonymous. To walk with God means to live by faith in God. And Enoch is an example of someone who lived by faith. This is the distinguishing mark of his life. It was so significant that the genealogical pattern was interrupted. He was a man who lived by faith. And the question is, what happened? How is it that Enoch is living, he has his firstborn son, and then all of a sudden, he makes a decision to live differently, to march by the beat of a different drummer, to start walking with God, to start believing in God, to start believing that He cares, to start believing that He is going to reward and take care of Him and fulfill His promises in His life. What happened? Was it fatherhood? It's Father's Day servant here. Sometimes when a person has a child, their whole life changes. I've seen it happen. Is that what is happening here? That after this boy, Methuselah, was born, man, he's on his knees and he's finding faith in God. <laughs> Maybe that Methuselah was that challenging of a boy. I don't know. Was it some other crisis event? I just have to believe that there's something that happened at this adult stage in his life that changed Enoch's direction. And all of a sudden, he begins walking with God, living in harmony, in step, living in faith with God. God. That's what the genealogist wants us to see here. Enoch walked faithfully with God and then he was no more because God took him away. The author of Hebrews says, by faith Enoch was taken away from this life so that he did not experience death. Here is a reward. In life, he was, the word, transferred from earth into the presence of God. He bypassed the curse of Adam, death, physical death. And God took him directly into heaven. Who wouldn't want that? Wouldn't you want to avoid the process of dying and death itself? Yeah, people say, I don't fear death. I just fear the process of dying. Well, he didn't have to go through either of that. Can you imagine? No battle with cancer or any other disease. No surgeries of any kind. No pain and suffering from arthritis. No lingering without your mind in a care facility for 8, 10, 19 years, you know. He bypassed all of that. That's a reward. The curse of death upon Adam and his descendants did not prevail in the case of Enoch. And one other person, the prophet Elijah, 2 Kings 2.10, Elijah was lifted up in a chariot of fire into heaven. He did not experience physical death. Everybody else does, even Jesus, but not these two men. That's a reward. He did not experience physical death. Well, what lessons can we learn here today? Um, I think we can be, or we, you may be the first person of faith in your family's genealogy. It appears that only Enoch here in all these ten generations, except for Noah coming, was a person of faith. And maybe that's you. That You can look in your past and say, there are no Christians in my family. I, I'm the first and the only Christian in your family. If, if that's true, what's your story? How did that happen? 
How is it that you, in the middle of a pagan family, came to faith in Christ? And is that story known and being recorded in any way? I have a picture that I love, and it's my mother's father in that picture as the boy standing. And this is her grandfather, Frederick. Frederick. And I come from a long line of people of faith. My, on both sides, mom and dad were Christians, their parents were Christian, their parents were Christians, all the way back to Germany, all the way back to Protestant Mennoniteism back in Europe. So I have this long history of faith in my family. And I'm so grateful because without that German Bible sitting on his lap, I wouldn't know if my great-grandfather was a Christian, but I believe he was, other than what my mom tells me. But I love that picture because it says something about my heritage. And so, how is it that you are communicating the fact that you are a person of faith? Well, do you have a picture with the Bible? You're holding the Bible? Maybe you should have a family picture and get the Bible out and put it on your lap. Um, this is why I ask at funerals, do you have a certificate of baptism? You know, I always ask, is there a document that says somewhere that you came to faith in Christ? Uh, do you have a diary? You know, why do we have Augustine's confessions to this day? They were his diary of how he struggled and came to faith, and they're in print to this very day. That's why we have them. And then, of course, this, you can do this. Can you do this? Can you write a book? about your life? Sherwood wrote a book. Look at that. This is volume one that was published. Volume two is on CD. <laughs> but Sherwood writes here, his funeral was last February. Here he shows when his brothers and sisters came to faith and they were baptized in the little Baptist church there in Texas, what the family celebrated, you know, after the fact. And then on his CD, he devotes an entire chapter to his story of how he came to faith in Jesus Christ right here in Sacramento at First Baptist Church downtown. You know, he has documented the fact of his faith. His children and grandchildren and grandchildren continuing will always know that Sherwood was a man who embraced the Christian faith. So I just challenge you, what, what ways are you recording the fact that you're a person of faith so that the next generations will know that they belong to this history of faith. Number three, Noah, the unique builder. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. The story of Noah is in Genesis 6 through Genesis 9, and so I'm not going to read three chapters to you. I think you get the idea of Noah in, in, in that story. I think you've heard the story of Noah, not the TV or the, the movie version of Noah. Please don't follow that. Follow the scripture. But two descriptions you need to know. One is the description of the population and the culture that was happening in Noah's day. It says in Genesis 6, 5, that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race was, had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. So that's what Noah was living in. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. There's that word again. Smiles with the corner of your mouth going up. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. There's that same phrase referring to uh, Enoch. Noah, too, was a unique man, an exceptional man. What made him the proverbial needle in the haystack was he had faith. He walked with God. He was in step with God. He lived in harmony with God. He believed that God existed and that God cared and that God was going to reward him in this life and in the age to come. But Noah is alone. Noah is alone as a righteous man in his culture. And what did Noah do? Outnumbered in his culture, it says, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. 
uh, the desire to build an ark did not come from an inner hunch that he had. He hadn't been listening to the weatherman or reading scientists about a flood that might come. No, God favored him and confided in him what was going to happen, and there was absolutely no clue what was coming. God communicated to Noah what was going to happen and his plan. And Noah, as it said, followed God's plans to the letter to build this enormous wooden ark. Noah, again, is building in the confidence that God exists, that God cares, and God is going to reward. And he acts, as it says, in holy fear. This is not dreaded personal consequences. This is not being timid or afraid of God. It means that he acted out of a deep sense of reverential trust and hope that God would save him and, as promised, his family. And this construction took about 100 years. It says he was 500 years old when it started, and it was 600, he was 600 years old when it started to rain. So Noah built the ark by faith. What makes this even more remarkable is not even the size of the project, but the fact that some scholars wonder if it had ever rained on the earth at that point. You see, back in Genesis 2 in the Garden of Eden, it says in Genesis 2, 5 through 6, that God had not yet sent rain on the earth. So there's a period of time where it had not rained, and we don't know if it had rained between then and where it says in, in Genesis 7 that God caused it to rain. So it's possible that it had never yet rained on the earth when Noah was building the ark, which makes it really crazy. And, again, where was it built? Nowhere close a large body of water. One commentary says it's 500 miles to the biggest body of water where Noah built. How are you going to move it, Noah? <laughs> you can't move this thing 10 feet much less a mile or 500 miles. I mean, this thing is enormous. It's three football fields long, right? <laughs> it would fit in our whole parking lot. <laughs> Imagine moving that. <laughs> Noah and his sons. So, again, it took faith. Can you think about that? You're building this thing for 100 years. Wouldn't you be discouraged? <laughs> really? I mean, oh, my word. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. You see, his actions speak louder than his words. Our actions sometimes cause people to have various kinds of feelings, like Abel, I mean, Cain and Abel. I mean, Abel's righteous actions created in Cain a murderous thought. So we can make people, not by accident almost, feel, uh, you know, inadequate or guilty or jealous. Um, and, and that's what happened. As Noah was out there building this ark, his actions were condemning the culture who did not join him, who refused to believe in him. And whether or not they mocked him, that doesn't, is not in the scripture, but Second Peter 2, 5 does make Noah a preacher of righteousness giving us the indication that he may have had some verbal conversations with the people in his culture as he was building his actions condemned the world and he became an heir an heir who gets who are heirs but family members right God promised a new covenant with Noah I'm going to make a new agreement with you. You are going to be the nucleus of my new family that I'm going to progress throughout the rest of the ages. All of my promises are for you and forward to all of your descendants. So they weren't just going to survive it. They were going to become heirs of God's promises for the next age. So what lessons can we build, learn from Noah? One is that living by faith will put you in the minority. <laughs> he was clearly in the minority. Uh, he was outnumbered. Even though it says that Christians are the largest religion in the world, 2.5 billion people, the world is still, what, 7 billion people. So we're still in the minority. 
and increasingly so as the day draw nears. So you may be the lone Christian in your apartment complex. You may be the lone Christian on your block. You may be the lone Christian in your family. Take courage. Noah set you an example of how it is that you can live by faith when you are in the clear minority. Live by faith. March to the beat of a different drummer. Living by faith can save your family. The presence of one Christian does not go unnoticed in God's eyes here. You know, Paul says in 1 uh, Corinthians 7 that the believing spouse somehow sanctifies the unbelieving spouse and the unbelieving children. Man, that is a mysterious statement. But Noah was saved. His wife was saved. His three sons were saved. Their wives were saved. Eight people in all were saved because Noah is the only one that said he had faith, but they, they all had to get in the ark, right? They too had to respond, and they got in the ark, and God shut the door. So a response is necessary, but it was Noah's faith that opened the door for them. And if other people had believed, they could have got in the ark as well and been saved, but only those who got in the ark were saved. And so faith must require your action as well. And then lastly, living by faith may lead you to pursue Bihog. Bihog. That's big, hairy, audacious goals. <laughs> okay. Bihag. Yeah, right. I, I did not invent that. I heard that in a seminar. But big, hairy, audacious goals. When you think the ark is a big, hairy, audacious goal. I mean, it is so big that humanly you would, you would not do that. Only if God showed up and God told you to do it, would you do that. And I don't know, God may be you, do that to you. He may put in your heart a dream that is so big and so outrageous, but it's from Him. And He wants you to be like Noah and go do it. The rest of your life, work toward that huge goal. So just to summarize, by faith, Abel paid the price of his life. Because of his faith, Enoch was taken from this life, and by faith, Noah saved his own family's life. And so I want to encourage you today to think about whether or not you belong to the Hall of Faith. These people were all common people, but what made them uncommon and what got them mentioned in Scripture was they had faith. Do you have it? Are you one who has followed in their footsteps. Do you have the Isaacs of faith today? If you don't, I challenge you, now is the time. Believe that God exists, that he cares for you, and that he will take care of you in the future. And it begins by acknowledging Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, and putting your faith and trust in him. Thank you, Lord, for our time here together as we um, are considering these examples of faith and Lord they're there for our instruction they're there that we might model them thank you for the promises that are given today in Jesus name amen